So before we talked about integrated pest management, now I'm going to talk about some of the more common uh, critters in the greenhouse that we have to deal with. And there are a lot more that you're going to have to deal with depending on your part of your country, but these are the primary ones. And probably the one that I see more than anything else are aphids. Green peach aphid is the most common. Uh, you'll find the melon aphid, you'll find all kinds of different aphids. But uh, it's a phloem feeder, and as a scout, it's easy to find phloem feeders because they're going to be uh, colonizing parts of the plant that are rapidly growing, and they're going to be um, piercing and sucking into the phloem, so you're going to find them on stems. Uh, they secrete a honeydew as their frass, um, which causes the black soot mold that we often see on plants that are overly infested. And of course, um, they give birth to live females without even mating. So um, they're pretty uh, productive little critters. They're born pregnant. They're born pregnant, yes. Um, fungus gnats and shore flies. Um, Fungus gnats are a small gray fly. Um, the fungus gnat larvae is a, a little about a quarter of an inch long, uh, white with a, a black head. Um, the adults feed on decaying organic matter and algae. That's it. However, the larvae will feed on roots. Shore fly is a uh, sometimes often mistaken for a fungus gnat. Uh, the shore fly, uh, their wings are parallel with their body, whereas the fungus gnat, they're, they're splayed out. Uh, the shore fly isn't much of a problem because of its larvae doesn't, they don't feed on the root systems. They're just more of a nuisance. So the larvae, and here's a picture of the larvae in the soil um, of a fungus gnat larvae. And they're white. Uh, these are a little more clear. Um, and you can see the little black head. One of the things that I do to bait uh, fungus gnats, fungus gnat larvae, to see if they're heavy infestations is I'll take a slice of a potato and put it on the soil. And as the potato starts to rot, they'll come up to the potato and feed on it. So that's, that's more of a bait. It's not to, to see if they're there as a scouting tactic. It's not a control tactic even though some people will think it is. Um, here's an infestation on these plug, in this plug tray uh, in this corner area where it was getting excess water on this, cap there's a capillary mat. And when you have fungus gnat problems, to me, fungus gnats mean you're watering too much because uh, it typically uh, happens from overwatering, typically happens when the plants are under stress, these sorts of things. We don't want to sell plants full of fungus gnats to our consumers because um, they're going to come back and accuse you of, the, of having fungus gnats. However, when I see little gnats in my house, it's not typically from fungus gnats. It's typically fruit fries from the compost bucket not being changed out. <laughs> this is what fungus heavy infestation in fungus gnats will do to poinsettias. Um, all of these poinsettia stems are basically the same age old same age, and as you can see where the heavy infestations on the left of fungus gnat larvae, uh, they've just been chomping on these plants and they're basically not going anywhere, where the healthier ones are doing a lot better. So fungus gnat larvae will uh, chew on roots, uh, it will give us problems. Um, we used to think that fungus gnats were more of a nuisance, but when we discovered that they were actually eating on the roots, we were taking some more aggressive standards on it. I worked with a grower once that had a fungus gnat problem so bad, and the owner of the company uh, thought he knew more than I did. And the humidity in the greenhouse was so high that he had uh, botrytis infections on the stem. And uh, the fungus gnat larvae actually colonized the rotted part of the stem. So he assumed that the fungus gnats were crawling through this vascular system. So he had the grower put on a really harsh systemic insecticide and killed his crop and then tried to blame me. So anyway. Leaf miners. Um, 
Leaf miner, uh, again, the adults don't give us much of a problem. It's a big, chunky fly. Uh, the adults are attracted to light, so oftentimes we see leaf miners uh, colonizing plants uh, in propagation facilities where we're doing night lighting uh, to bring in, to extend the photo period. So uh, the stocky fly comes in and she oviposits her eggs into uh, the foliage and they tunnel through the foliage and uh, you know once this damage is there you can't get rid of it. And then the larvae will tunnel up to about two weeks and then when they pupate they fall into the soil and the cycle starts all over again. Uh, there are um, some things that you can do for leaf miners. The, the easiest thing to do is is to screen or to not uh, have the lights on. Question. Uh, if you rip the leaves off, will it get rid of them, or do you have to worry about something happening? If you cut the leaves off, it does get rid of them because they're. Um, it, but you want you want to make sure you cut the leaves off before they pupate and the tunnels out. Of course, if you've got a greenhouse full of these, that's a lot of leaves to clip out. But um, there's really nothing you can apply. We used to use a systemic uh, insecticide called Temic. Uh, which had an LD50 of about five, um, and uh, where it would, the, what you need is a uh, insecticide. If you're going to put an insecticide that'll kill the larvae, it's got to do translaminar um, infiltration throughout the cells, and the systemic pesticides that we have now, the neonicotinoids, which are things like Marathon and Merit and a couple of others, Safari, they only get the phloem feeders. They don't get the, the, the foliage feeders. There is some anecdotal evidence that's, and some work that's been done at UC Davis where they have fertilized the plants with a fertilizer that's high in silica. And as the plant is growing, the silica in the cells tends to curb how much leaf miner damage will happen. But like I said, it's, you'd have to start from day one from the beginning to get this enough silica in the plant to prevent leaf miner damage. You can't put silica, the silica has to be laid down as the plant cell walls develop. You can't fertilize the plant and expect it to infiltrate into the cell walls. Make sense? So, um, and I think some of the higher end hydroponic solutions you can buy at the, the at the hydroponic store, silica is starting, we're starting to see it pretty common in uh, a lot of fertilizers, uh, higher end hydroponic fertilizers. Um, silica is also very important in turf and rice and crops like that. Mealybugs. Mealybug is a, a small oval insect and you can really see that picture, it came out big. Um, they're, they have a, a white waxy coating on them that protects the, the body. It's a piercing and sucking insect, much like an aphid. Um, so you'll find them on rapidly growing tissue. It again secretes a honeydew. Um, this is the adult. And here are some crawlers over here in the little corner. This is the crawler stage. If you're going to use an insecticide, this is the stage that they're susceptible. And the insecticides that most people use are either dormant oil sprays or soaps, insecticidal soaps. Insecticidal soaps will have some impact on the adults because it breaks down that powdery substance so they can actually get to them. But it's before they develop the powdery, waxy coating that this insect is most susceptible to any kind of a pesticide spray. Um, because they're a phloem feeder, the systemics work well. Um, on foliage plants, for most people that have house plants, unless it's something that's really precious to you, to me, the best solution for mealybugs is the trash can. Um, I'm sorry. Um, because they'll get into the root system, and once you clean the adults out of the plants, then they come back out of the root system, and they're just kind of a generation. Mites, spider mites, are not insects. They're arachnids, uh, but we deal with them the same way. We have cyclamen mite, which is a very small uh, mite, almost need a, um, a hand lens or uh, a um, microscope to see them, very small. They're semi-transparent. 
The two-spotted mite is the most common. Uh, it's got these two black spots on either side of its uh, body parts. And there, uh, a, a, they pierce the skin, pierce the cuticle of the foliage, and they cause a stippling effect. Um, just like thousands of tiny pricks into the, into the foliage. Uh, the cyclamen mite is there, they're much smaller. Uh, hard to even see that that's, an, that's actually an animal. But the two-spotted mite is the one we primarily see. It's the one we see uh, in reference to uh, hot, dry greenhouses. Um, if you have webbing on your um, plants from spider mites, you've let it go way too long. And once they start to web out, the best solution is the trash can. Scale insects, uh, there are lots of different uh, genera of scale. Uh, these are um, oyster shell scale, I believe. Um, they have a waxy scale that protects their body, uh, makes them very hard to kill with pesticides. Um, again, the dormant oil sprays where they actually suffocate the insect is the best. Piercing and sucking like aphids, um, white flies, mealybugs. So the systemic pesticides will work. Again, like the mealybug, the crawler stage before it develops this heavy waxy coating is the most susceptible to control. Again, on foliage plants where I see a heavy infestation of foliage, the best thing is the trash can. So here's an example of scale infestation on a palm, um, interior scape palm that's way too much to deal with. Slugs and snails, they're mollusks. Um, slugs uh, lack a shell. Uh, snails have a shell. They have chewing mouth parts. They hide in dark, most lake locations. You'll walk into your greenhouse and you'll see the foliage has been chewed on. Your first thought is, I have mice. Well, no, it's you have snails. You don't see the snails because they're in the daylight, they're hiding. They get up under the bench, they get up under the pots, uh, they feed at night. And if you get up early, if you can see the slime, sna slime trails. Um, slugs and snails are animals that have the most teeth of all animals in the world. They have more teeth than a shark. They have more teeth, and they're constantly regenerating. So. They're pretty big chompers. Um, the best way to keep slugs and snails out of your greenhouse is to keep the floor dry and keep the debris out of the, out of the um, plants. Thrips. The primary thrips that we, there's lots of thrips, but the primary thrips that we deal with in greenhouses is the western flower thrips. And it's very small insect, very tiny. Um, they're not a strong flyer. So they're, they're often carried in on wind currents. They're carried on other plant products. Um, they're primarily a, a nectar and pollen feeder. So the most likely place to find thrips is in the flowers. Um, you can take, uh, like if you're in a cucumber house, you can breathe into the flower with your, your a little, with warm breath, and they'll kind of scoot out to see what the humidity is about, and then they'll hide, run back in. They have a rasping mouth part, so there's like a little bitty rototiller. So the disease, I mean, the, the, the damage looks like little scrapings on the foliage. Since it's a rasping mouth part and it's scraping, the systemic insecticides do not work, period. Um, the issue with western flower thrips, the primary issue, is they're a vector for uh, two tospoviruses, impatiens necrotic spot virus and tomato spotted wilt virus. They're act the virus actually uh, matriculates itself and they've co-evolved, the virus and the western flower thrips have co-evolved. So for it to transmit the virus, uh, it has to um, come from an adult who uh, 
lays eggs onto the plant of, an, of a host plant, and it's the um, juveniles that uh, spread the disease. So this is the western flower thrips. Uh, this picture is about an eighth, this little critter is just under an eighth of an inch long. Uh, you, when they're in the larval stages, you can see the little bright red eyes. Uh, like I said, they're not strong flyers, but this particular insect is so ubiquitous, they found them in the jet stream. Um, this is an ovipositing uh, thrips, and the video didn't run. White flies. White flies is probably our most common insect pest that we have. Um, it's a piercing mouth part, just like aphids, and just like uh, mealybugs, and just like scale. Um, all of them secrete a honeydew. Um, again, the most susceptible stage is when they're in their first and second instar stage. Like little guy right here, there's pictures of the of the white flies that where the they've split open. That's actually where the adult has crawled out of a pupa. Um, here's a better picture. You can see where they come out of there. There's this instar stage right there. Um, this is the greenhouse white fly. And then we have the silver leaf white fly. And you can see it's a little, a little bigger. The wings are a little more laid back. You'll also hear the silver leaf white fly called a poinsettia white fly or the watermelon light white fly or a couple others. Um, people have tried to get away from calling it by a crop because they don't want to implicate a crop. The politics in the plant world. Um, they're a little harder to control. They have a little bit different temperature manifestation. But uh, it's important to know your species. Uh, for instance, the, the silver leaf white fly, um, it's susceptible to a different uh, parasitoid than the greenhouse white fly, but they're both susceptible to similar um, pesticides. So. Again, the neonicotinoids, which are uh, uh, systemic, are very effective on white flies. Um, most of the pyrethrums and pyrethroids are, are effective on white flies, um, as well as the soaps and the uh, oils and such. The best way to keep white flies under control is to be under strict management. Okay, that's my half a lecture introduction to greenhouse entomology. And let me you all know that entomology is a much bigger subject than that. So now I want to talk about some different diseases and insects. I mean diseases and, and um, viruses. You know I mentioned the uh, TOSPA viruses. Um, the traditional symptomology of a TOSPA virus is this um, shotgun that you see in the top left-hand photograph on a dahlia. And that's real, this, this ringing is really uh, uh, endemic of impatiens necrotic spot virus. And here you'll see it down on impatiens and on a cineraria where the foliage is more crinkly. And here we see what impatiens necrotic spot virus will do to the fruit of a tomato. Um, is this fruit inedible? No, it's fine, um, but it just looks nasty. Um, you're not going to want to eat it. Um, there are some TOSPA viruses out there that are mammalian, but they're pretty rare. It's things like blue tongue and cattle and stuff like that. So, But this is one of our biggest uh, problems we have with the impatiens necrotic spot virus, tomato spotted wilt virus. Um, it's uh, transmitted. The vector is the western flower thrips. Control the thrips, you control the virus. Once the virus gets into the crop, you can't get rid of it. The only way to get rid of it is to put it in the dumpster and not in the compost bin. Um, 
Virus-free, uh, buying virus-free materials is very important. Um, so, the, so here we have tobacco mosaic virus, which uh, is, um, it's interesting to note that there's more, typically they find more tobacco mosaic virus in pipe and cigar tobacco than they do in cigarette tobacco. I don't know enough about tobaccos to know why they would be different. I'm sorry? Maybe it's all those weird chemicals in cigarettes. Well, it would be in the uh, infected plant tissue. It would be the pesticides they would use before to prevent, okay. prevent uh, but also uh, tomato, uh, tobacco mosaic virus is, uh, it can be transmit, uh, tra the, the vector is anybody. It could be tra vectored on a tool, dirty hands, um, that kind of exposure where uh, you can't, you can rub two plants together that have tobacco mosaic virus and that'll transmit the virus. You can take, you cannot do that with impatient necrotic spot virus. You can't rub two plants together. It has to be introduced by the thrips. So for, you know, when they look at virus resistance, they have to actually grow the plant with live thrips that have been infested, infected with the virus. So. And there are lots of viruses on geraniums, um, so forth. Bacterial blight of geraniums. Uh, the most common one is Xanthomonas pelargoni. Uh, and this is a real problem for all geranium growers. Uh, it's a bacterial wilt. You have to, the only way you can get rid of it, because it's systemic, is to rogue the plant and grow back uh, virus. Uh, bacterial free, bacterial free certified propagation material. Once this gets into the ground beds or your garden beds, it's there and you have to rotate out um, geraniums for about three years before you can plant back in it again. That's why over at the field, gr field grounds, they're very, trial grounds are very careful about where they put geraniums to, the, to, to make sure they don't get a uh, contamination of uh, xanthomonas. It's very, this, this triangle effect that you see of the dead necrotic tissue is very um, typical, but it's often confused with botrytis. So the important thing is if you think you have a xanthomonas outbreak before you go in there and start taking massive treatments to sterilize the soil, send it to a lab and have it tested. Another uh, bacterial blight, um, is Ralstonia solanocerum. Um, there are several variants of Ralstonia solanocerum. Variant one um, is uh, southern bacterial wilt, which has driven the potato industry out of the southern United States into places like Idaho and Colorado and North Dakota. Um, it does not um, uh, infect plants or it does not survive in the soil north of approximately the Mason-Dixon line. Variant three um, is um, not present in the United States and it's considered a um, back, uh, pathogenic terrorist tool. In other words, um, we had a scare about several years ago where Ralstonia solanoserum variant 3 got into the United States in a geranium shipment out of Kenya. It's endemic to Africa and other parts of South America and um, put the whole country on geranium alert. And because the potential risk, uh, why it's considered a bioterrorist agent, is that somebody could take infected tissue and throw it into an irrigation canal and literally wipe out a farm. Uh, should it be a back, should it be a bioterrorist agent? I think it's a little absurd, but who knew, we can't tell USDA and our military and our people what to consider and what not to consider. Um, it got to a big, be a big mess. So that's basically the only bacterial disease. You know, Irwinia is there, um, but Irwinia, we typically just see that on rotting plant tissue. Um, for those of you who've taken any fruit production classes, you're familiar with fire blight. 
We just, in our greenhouse crops, we don't have that problem. Fungal diseases are primarily our biggest issue. We have leaf foliar fungal diseases and we have root zone foliar diseases. Powdery mildew, um, they're species specific, which means they're an obligate parasite. In other words, the uh, powdery mildew that we see around here, the Spherotheca rosea, is Spherotheca rosea because it's the only powdery mildew that colonizes roses. So if the rose has got powdery mildew and there's a tomato plant next door, it's not going to get powdery mildew from the rose. If it gets powdery mildew, it's a powdery mildew that's specific to that plant. Okay? So the best way to control powdery mildew is typically with the environment. Uh, we see powdery mildew outbreaks when it's cool and moist. A rose grower, what they'll do uh, is they will start heating their greenhouse as the sun goes down and open the vents and turn on the HAF fans to dry the place out. That is a much more effective way to control powdery mildew than suiting up and spraying the greenhouse with rubigan, which is very nasty. You can control it with eradicants and protectants. An eradicant is a fungicide, a protectant is a fungistat. Most of our fungicides that we use are not fungicides, but they're fungistats. The eradicants that we use will take and kill the powdery mildew that's there, but won't prevent it from coming back. Whereas the protectants, we spray that on a prophylactic means, which keeps it from coming back. Um, most rose growers will try to control their, their powdery mildew with the environment. And just before they'll do a harvest, they'll come in with a cold water mist and just wash the powdery mildew off, strip the foliage, and the powdery mildew will not come back fast enough for the consumer to ever even know it was infected. So the pesticides are not always the solution. Now here's another picture of powdery mildew. Early in my career at CSU, I did powdery mildew research, and I was known as the person to grow powdery mildew. Downy mildews are different. Here we see downy mildew on a salvia, and you see this uh, necrosis on the top, and on the bottom side, we get a spore development. Um, here's the necrosis on the top of the foliage. And another photo. And here's uh, downy mildew on snapdragons, and you see how distorted the leaves get. And on the underside, the spore development has this nice purplish tinge. Uh, this is a major problem in cut snapdragons. Snapdra cut snapdragons grown as a cut flower are very profitable for local markets and uh, for farmer's market type because the snapdragon does not ship well. If you lay a snapdragon on its side, the geotropism will um, cause the stem to distort, so it has to be shipped in an upright container. Um, but um, we seem to see um, downy mildew problems when we have cold, wet winters in Colorado. I didn't have one report of downy mildew this year. So, But tritus, oftentimes we call that just common gray mold. Uh, high humidity, we typically see botrytis infections on bruised tissue. Uh, botrytis will infect anything. It primarily uh, infects tissue that's high in sugar, like uh, petals. Petals are most susceptible, like geranium petals and stuff. So oftentimes, by growing the plant, spacing your plants properly so you have airflow, and also so you don't have a lot of plants touching each other. Um, think of the kids in the back seat, don't touch me, he touched me. Um, that sort of a thing. If you keep the, the geranium um, petals from touching each other, you'll avoid that. Here we see a nice heavy infection on a carnation bloom. Um, here we see in the lower left, botrytis uh, stem blight on vinca. Um, this is probably from the uh, bedding plants, flats of bedding plants. Here we see botrytis blight in the top left um, with um, 
What the grower should have done as these petals start to uh, decline is go back in and deadhead. That's why, why deadheading in the greenhouse is very important. Um, but try to splite on poinsettias. This is in a propagation bed where they've used too much mist. And here in the far right is a vinca stem from uh, the plants to the far left. So that's typically the foliar diseases we deal with. Um, there are others out there, but those are the primary ones. Um, root rot diseases, uh, the primary ones we see are Pythium, Rhizoctonia, and Thaleviopsis. Pythium, we typically see Pythium when the greenhouse is cold, you're overwatering, the soil isn't draining well, contaminated soil. Rhizoctonia, a little warmer, we see that late spring. And Thaleviopsis, we used to see it primarily in, in potting soils that where the pH was too high. By keeping the pH below um, 6, we typically didn't see Thaleviopsis, but that's starting to change. We're starting to see Thaleviopsis infestations at lower and lower pHs. Um, pythium, here's a poinsettia on the left is infected with Pythium. Poinsettia on the right is clean. These plants are the same age. Um, pythium is very easy to identify in the field. You take the root and you pull on the rotted root tissue and the cortical tissue will slough off and it'll leave the vascular stem, the vascular steel, S-T-E-L-E, -E, where the, the xylem is on the root tissue and it uh, leaves a little wire root. And so when you're to pull off this rotted tissue, it leaves a little bit of a piece of the vascular system there. Whereas rhizoctonia infects it all the way through. And that's how you tell the difference. Of course, it's always best to uh, do a test. Uh, there are literally thousands of species of Pythium. Not all of them are pathogenic. This is rhizoctonia root rot. And you see just the general de decaying of the roots in general. And Thalaviopsis, we call it black root rot. It's just this solid black stem. And you can see how the roots are very black and very darker than Pythium infection, where Pythium is a little more uh, yellowish, rotted look, whereas Thalaviopsis is very blackened. OK. Applying a pesticide. And this doesn't matter if you're using an organic pesticide or a conventional pesticide. The most common uh, form of pesticide application we use in the greenhouse is what we call a high volume spray. And for high volume spray, they come in three forms, soluble powders, wettable powders, and emulsifiable concentrates. Now emulsifiable concentrates, it's important to know the difference because emulsifiable concentrates typically have xylol or xylene or something like that to bring the pesticide into suspension. Because it's the goal of the pesticide manufacturer to deliver a concentrated product to you that you can dilute up and apply to your plants. Wettable powders, when you put them into, the, into your mix, it's just a powder that stays wet. Your sprayer has to um, constantly agitate the solution to keep it into suspension. Soluble powders actually dissolve into the water like a salt. I'd like to point out that a lot of people will tank mix multiple products. So they've got aphids and spider mites. But they are different animals. They require different pesticides. So you'll put in maybe different compounds. Never, ever, ever apply two tank mixed emulsifiable concentrates. Because the product that the carrier, the xylols, if we use two times the dose, now we're going to have a phyto, um, phytotoxic damage to the plant. But you can tank mix an EC with a WP, an EC with an SP, a WP with a WP, an SP with an SP, 
SP, you know, but you cannot double up emulsifiable concentrates. And in fact, we're seeing fewer and fewer and fewer of them because emulsifiable concentrates are typically flammable and UPS will not ship them. So high volume sprayer, this is a, a DRAM type and you can see this, this gentleman doing a nice high volume spray application. Backpack sprayers, there's all different kinds of sprayers out there. Low volume sprays. S low volume sprays have a smaller droplet size. We use a lower pesticide rate. We're applying at a higher concentration, typically applying at a mist some of our pesticide applicators actually electrostatically charge the particles to make them attach to the insect, make them more lethal. Um, so this is a, these are Motan units where here's the pesticide concentrate, here's the water it dilutes it with, and it goes through an atomizer and it's blown through the greenhouse. Uh, this uh, device here is actually permanently mounted in the greenhouse. These are common in, uh, nor in Europe. Um, the idea behind this particular device, of course, here's the little pesticide unit, little water mixing, is you set these up, up to run, put it on a timer, and it comes on at midnight when no employees are there. So there's no risk to your employees. Here's another low volume sprayer. These are electrostatic sprayers. This is. Um, uh, a portable one, and what it's got in its spray nozzle, here's the spray head right here, uh, it's got a transformer right here in the handle that applies a charge to the pesticide as it comes out of the sprayer, gives it electrical charge so it sticks to the foliage with, like, with static electricity. Um, other low volume sprayers include this mist spray sprayer applicator um, where you just uh, walk through the greenhouse and it mists your plants. Aerosol. Um, aerosol is another low volume application uh, tactic. Aerosol, um, most of you have probably used an aerosol insecticide to kill wasps, right? Or to get the insects out of your apartment. You've used a, a fogger, okay, a can. It comes as a cylinder under pressure. A lot of the aerosols are encapsulated. That means the pesticide itself is encapsulated in a little microcon, um, a micron size uh, capsule that delivers and protects the pesticide from the environment until it gets to its point of contact. There's two different kinds of aerosols. There's a total release which means that you set the can in the greenhouse, you click the button, and it fogs until it's all gone. Spot applications, like a can of spray paint. Just go in and spray them. The spot application aerosol products, most of them are registered for an interior scape. You can use them for small outbreaks. Yes, they cost a lot more money than a big bag of fertilizer per unit of fertilizer, but you don't have to mix it up. You don't have to clean up the pesticide application equipment. You go in and you spot spray and you're done. So if you've got an aphid infestation in one little corner of your greenhouse, you get this product out, spot spray, put it away and you're done. Okay? And like I said, well, there are several of them that are registered for interior scape that can be applied and used even in food handling areas. Thermal fogs. Um, Thermal fogs are where we take the pesticide and heat the pesticide into, into a vapor. It's a small, vo low volume application. When you're using thermal fogs, the greenhouse has to be tight. Um, these are pretty dangerous to apply. Uh, you need to have good understanding and good relationship with your personal protective equipment. Um, I don't see many people doing these anymore. And in fact, I've, the only one I've seen of these recently is mounted on a piece of um, artwork at the Sweatville Zoo to make it look like a ray gun on, on a spacecraft. <laughs> but what it's doing is it's actually heating the pesticide and applying it as a vapor. Um, smoke application. 
we are uh, applying the pesticide as a uh, in a in a in a smoke. Uh, we used to use that for things like uh, tedion, tedion dithio, parathon, uh, nicotine sulfate. Actually, for a while, nicotine sulfate used to be considered an organic pesticide. Um, a lot of these uh, smoked applications are very, very low phytotoxicity. They have a rapid um, kill. They get into all the cracks and crevices in the greenhouse. Um, of course, you have to have all the ventilation equipment off, and you want to make sure the fire department knows that you're going to apply this material. Uh, products like ni uh, nicotine sulfate, why it was common and popular is that even though you could still smell the smoke generator days after you used it, the nicotine itself, uh, the sunlight destroyed it within 24 hours, and you can do a um, predatory insect release right away. Vaporizers, um, only a few products are really registered. Um, it's not an illegal application method. method. Uh, we typically see uh, volatilization buckets primarily for sulfur. Um, this is just a little heater and it kind of melts and solubilizes and the sulfur will vaporize off of, out of this little bucket. And that's really good for powdery mildew control. Okay. When you're burning sulfur in a greenhouse, though, it's really bad for your lungs. So you don't want to have people in there working. I have seen people take and put elemental sulfur on their heating pipes. That's not a good thing. Um, yes, it works. Yes, it volatilizes the sulfur. But also, when sulfur volatilizes and mixes with oxygen and water, what have we got? We have sulfuric acid, and it corrodes the pipes really bad. So if you want to put it on your pipes, put it in a pan, like a little pie pan. Put it in there and put that on the pipe, and then get rid of the pie pan. So 